very much, Arete. I'd like, like to welcome Laura Gottlieb to talk to us about four installations in the Swedish Museum of Performing Arts. Oh. <coughs> Hello. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, uh, okay. Maybe I take this off. Uh, so I'm really glad to follow this. Oh, thank you. This presentation because I feel like it's so relevant to what I've been working on. So I feel like I'm just kind of continuing the talk, maybe. <laughs> uh, but um, I just want to give you a bite size of what I've been working on. I don't want to overwhelm you with all the little bits. Just kind of introduce the methodology that we're that we're developing, and able and to enable um, installations and museums to be tested and developed in a certain methodology. So. This is the museum that I've been working at, or with, rather, to, do, to evaluate um, these installations. Uh, it's the Swedish Museum of Performing Arts. And what's interesting about this museum is that it was previously called the Music Museum. So they've tried to incorporate other themes of performing arts. So they've included dance and theater, and also before it was mainly analog, so now they want to change the way that they communicate with their audiences. So by incorporating uh, digital artifacts and installations through, throughout the, the exhibition to embed digital and analog together. Um, and so the main, I'm really annoyed by this little person there. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm just going to ignore him. Um, so <laughs> so our, our main aim for the museum was to get um, feedback from their future audiences uh, so that they can fi finalize these installations and really make them much better and relevant to their audiences. And so for us as well, it was a useful opportunity to test this method, Nix, which is a working title. Uh, to see if it can fulfill the purpose of, of the museum. Uh, so to explain what this is about, um, so um, it's a, a mix <laughs> between uh, methods used in different fields. So in interaction design, you have use qualities, which is a, a way to categorize aspects of a uh, digital artifact. So there's ways of talking about the artifact, but to bring it into a more museum environment where you can incorporate this framework throughout the process, the iterative design process, and also find ways of um, talking to different age groups and audiences and be able to collect data uh, through, uh, yeah, with this framework. So, uh, to talk about use qualities, it, it's, these are the main uh, five categories of use qualities. So motivation, immediate experience, social implication, creation of meaning, structural qualities. And within these categories, there's, there's more than this, but these are a selection of use qualities. And you can sort of pick the ones that are relevant to, to your particular study. So in motivation, you have, for example, some theories uh, from game, like game theory, so how seductive and playable it is. Like, do you want to go back and try it again? Is it relevant to your interests? Immediate experience, what is, was it easy to use? Could you affect or have a kind of control in your experience? Uh, what was the materiality like? Uh, social implication, probably the more obvious one, did it create some kind of interaction in the space? Did it create a social space? Creation of meaning. Did you understand the purpose of this interaction experience? Um, how did you, uh, did you learn something new from it? And the structural qualities is more about uh, the, the kind of aesthetics of it, but also that also affects whether it's easy to use. So putting this framework Within visitor studies, we adapted um, uh, 
to different audiences using questionnaires, discussions, observations. And so taking from some of the categories, we adapted the questions of the questionnaire to kind of reflect back on the use qualities. And as well with younger audiences, we, we tied those questions into the discussion so that we can sort of get feedback around the same things, but in different ways. Okay, and these were the target groups. So people between eight years and probably 80 <laughs> came to the museum for these uh, um, focus groups. And, um, and um, yes, <laughs> I think I've been talking too quickly. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about all the installations because I don't see why. And, uh, but I thought I would show you just quickly uh, the installations that we were uh, testing. So uh, I don't think the video works, but I'll just explain. Um, so this one is in the dance department or area of the museum where uh, through movements and gestures you can create visuals and sound. So it's just to encourage movement. Um, another installation was about, uh, it was called dance shoes. And they have a cabinet of dance shoes. And then they have this little screen that you can select the dance shoes and get a video that's relevant to the, to the shoes and some information about the shoes. Uh, another installation, which was in your presentation, <laughs> is about striking a pose and uh, getting a, a picture from the archive. So they have a, a vast archive of performance pictures so you can sort of playfully interact with an archive. And then the, the example that I will go into more detail with is this one, which is an interactive table with blocks. And the different sides of the blocks activate a different uh, instrumental song. So there's a cabinet of instruments and so you can sort of hear the sounds and interact with the sounds through these blocks. So it's kind of playful and creating your own compositions through this interactive table. And so I just want to talk about the results of this, um, this installation. And so um, the installation had like the most uh, prominent use quality was motivation for sure. <laughs> uh, and I can also say that it's a bit difficult to test all qualities <laughs> uh, when something is in a prototype uh, stage because structural qualities, it's very difficult to judge whether a installation is beautiful when it's not really finished. So, but it's also good to get feedback so that they can sort of finalize it in a way that would be appreciated by their uh, audience. So what we noticed, uh, why we deemed it as high motivation was because there was a very high playability, not only in the, in the questionnaires, but from observations. So one child cried because they weren't allowed to test this installation again. There was a group of kids that were fighting because they wanted to do it again. So also the teenagers that we had a very difficult group of teenagers that wouldn't really engage with any of the installations. They were, this was the installation that they were kind of dancing along to and feeling really excited about. And then we also asked all the groups about ratings and which ones they preferred the most. And this one was for sure the, the, the most the popular one. Uh, in the immediate experience, um, it was very easy to use. You move the blocks around and everyone said it was easy. Um, and they also felt that they were immersed in that experience. Um, but there were some things that were revealed, especially by the groups with disabilities. Things like the table is too high, there are no tactile uh, representations on top of the blocks for the visually impaired. Um, perhaps someone might get frustrated by not being able to compose a, a good sound, so maybe you can get some nudges towards what, what instruments fit well together. And then also, um, yeah, leave that for me. Uh, creation of meaning. 
It was also a, a bit of a difficult one when you ask people, did you learn something? And then people go, yes. And then you say, what did you learn? And then, and then there's a, it's a very ambiguous question as well, but you realize that it was a little bit maybe confusing to understand what the purpose was always. Although many people were happy just to, to play around and enjoy, some people were a bit frustrated because maybe they expect making compositions as kind of layering up with different sort of beats and here you have little songs that go together so so perhaps you can can work on that so that people understand the purpose a bit more and maybe can understand something more than that you can play with sounds maybe there are some instruments that are played together in a in a in a good way or maybe there's something you can learn about music culture so in more older age groups or focus groups, more sort of sophisticated answers about what more can I get from this experience was revealed. And then we have structural qualities. And I love what you said about easy to use doesn't always mean that it's intuitive because in the discussion, although people thought it was so easy to use, they actually didn't realize that there were so many functions to the blocks. So if you twist or if you move the blocks from side to side, there were different sort of functions and that wasn't clear at all so so in their sort of further design they really have to actually explain this or visualize it so that people can you know use this to its full potential and design and so social implication it's a difficult one because it's a focus group so it will be social uh, so uh, but what we could observe at least is that um, because multiple people can use this installation uh, at least for the younger ones there was a lot of friction or teamwork and uh, and what was nice in the um, the test is that everyone participated because they were listening to whoever was trying this and that was some a part of the discussion because in the real exhibition setting the user will use headphones and that sort of takes away a bit of like the the, per, the bystander being able to listen but that that is also a more of a what you can do in a museum if there's other installations around that also use sound and these sound showers aren't always that uh, sophisticated and might not be it wasn't really what the museum wanted so so uh, when speaking to the museum now the things that they've uh, decided to change is that they're going to visualize the function of the table better. So on the table, they'll show that the volume goes up and down and then it pans. And on top of the blocks that you can twist it. And they also want to add color to the blocks on the table. So you can sort of see a relationship that the blocks are meant to be on the table. Uh, and sort of also to have more information about the instruments on the sides so that you can sort of get a bit more about the instruments as you're playing them. And yeah, headphones debate ended there. Uh, so I think a positive thing about this, uh, this study was that the museum was very positive about it and would like to use it at an earlier stage of their development. So use it as a framework for when they start to design so that they can sort of plan their whole design process around this uh, framework because it might it is a little bit too late two months before they open to kind of rethink one of their installation that wasn't maybe very popular for example the, the the dancing shoes where you just press shoes and you get a video was not popular amongst any target group um, it didn't have any motivation really, uh, except one person. But um, had they maybe just had this idea and talked to it or tried it beforehand, maybe they would have, you know, introduced another activity like more of a quiz or a game to get people to want to use it. And so um, I think using um, different ways of collecting data was a good way to compare different audiences. So. It was, it was interesting to see that there were different preferred use qualities among the different target groups. So the kids were very 
you know, they prioritize the motivation and whereas some older groups were thinking much more about um, sort of the creation of meaning and perhaps didn't like an installation if they didn't see the purpose or that they got something from it more than a fun experience. So, so yeah, finding different ways to kind of compare the target groups um, was useful. And so next time around, we will do this again, and uh, we'll try to include this age group that we kind of left out. <laughs> uh, and we also need to really know the people better that come to these focus groups, because even though you know their age, you really don't know their abilities. And um, we were quite surprised often, because some groups maybe had learning disabilities, or the people with disabilities were, you know, fully functioning otherwise and it was just it was uh, it was much better to really have much more detailed information about the people so uh, the question that I'm kind of left with in sort of developing this method is how could this method support support an overall interpretation of the museum so what I mean by that is um, right now it, it feels like we very much look at one installation and we try to make it better but how do you understand this installation together with the other installations together with the museum so like how do you boil down this museum's message to something a bit more tangible something that you'll remember when you leave and how could this method sort of support or encourage museums to really think about that when they are developing these installations so that they're not just developing installations but that they're developing Thing this whole. So that's what I've been thinking about. And thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>